Well, it was another intriguing week for the financial markets last week. Further signs coming through that inflation might be starting to fade into the background just a little bit more in the US CPI and PPI prints. And of course, we also had another plethora of hawkish rhetoric from central bank speakers from both the Fed and the ECB. Having said that, markets continuing to take the path of least resistance, volatility continuing to come lower, equities grinding higher for a fourth week in a row on both sides of the Atlantic, and the dollar continuing to find little love, although we did have a little bit of a re- Bound on Friday. It's a busy week ahead. Earnings season continues on Wall Street, and we've got a data deluge coming from the UK, which will all feed into the next Bank of England decision on the 11th of May. As always, it's a busy show on the trade off this week, plenty for us to discuss. So without further ado, let's get into it. So plenty going on, lots to discuss. Let's bring in Ryan Littlestone from Forex Flow Live and Forex Analytics. Ryan, good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning, Mike. How are you doing? I'm, I'm back from a holiday. Um, the tan's really falling off in the shower. Um, <laughs> That's if you did that, I'm doing well. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing, no, mate? I'm very well, thank you, mate. I'm very well. Should we get this out of the way early? Do you want to gloat about the football over the weekend now? Me? Gloat? I would <laughs> never do such a thing. <laughs> um, no, uh, well, we've got, we got a draw against the league leaders, probably our best result of the season. So I'm not sure gloating is the right word for it, but uh, you gotta you got to make hay while the sun shines. So uh, I'm putting you under the cosh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly that. I mean, we're uh, we're doing our best to try and throw the title away. It's within our <laughs> grip, but we're trying to, to let go of it. Um, let's get into something that we uh, uh, can be a little bit more optimistic about, which is the markets in uh, Topical Thunder. So I want to talk about uh, inflation, first of all. It feels like we end up talking about this every week, but I guess that just shows how significant a subject it is, both in terms of the broader macro economy, but also in terms of the financial markets. Um, We had the latest CPI and more importantly, perhaps PPI numbers out of the United States last week, and both are starting to move in the right direction in a little bit more of a convincing manner. Headline CPI rolled over to 5.1% on a yearly basis, and the PPI print also coming in below expectations at 2.7% year on year. And I think the PPI is is notable because not only is it a two-year low, but it also implies that some of the price pressures that have been coming down that pipeline from factory prices into consumer prices may be starting to ease. But I think it's too early to breathe a sigh of relief and say that this is all behind us and disinflation is firmly underway because the core inflation number, when you strip out energy and when you strip out food, re-accelerates to 5.6% year on year. And I think that gives us a clear indication that, well, one, we're not out of the woods, and two, that rates are going to have to remain higher for longer. I think the market and the sell side and pretty much everyone you talk to is now coming round to this view that the Fed are going to give us another 25 basis point hike in May and then hit pause. The question, though, is what happens after that? because the market is still pricing in somewhere between 40 and 50 basis points worth of cuts, depending on which measure you use between now and the end of the year. The Fed are saying that's not going to happen. If you look at the dot plot, if you listen to the speeches that are coming out of the Fed, the message is very much a token, symbolic 25 bips more in the uh, at the May meeting on the 2nd of, or, or 3rd of May, and then we're going to stay there for the rest of the year. So I think the focus now for me, Ryan, is really who wins that battle? Is it the market that's right on this, or is it the Fed that's going to be proved right on this? <laughs> that shows the fun of the markets because if you'd asked me that uh, Thursday afternoon, um, I'd say the the doves are winning because uh, you know they saw the data, they hit the dollar, they hit yields, and then even on Friday, um, you know we got a really poor retail sales number, and I thought, okay, here we go, this will give them uh, you know more impetus to sell the dollar, but the market picked out little bits from that report and then we also had uh you know much better industrial production we had that michigan survey as well with that one year inflation expectation jumping a whole 100 pips to 4.6 percent and the market said oh well hang on a minute maybe we're not uh, going to be cutting so soon and the, the dollar completely reversed but to your point on inflation you know inflation is continuing to drop and this isn't a new thing it's been happening since last june july um headline inflation coming down but that core number is still sticky it should in theory if the headline continues start to pull down but it's it's the rate at which it's going to pull down that's going to be the issue and we need to remember even though 
in the, the the gains of inflation are coming down they're still gains so you know prices are still moving up they're just not moving up as fast and so when you when you pick pull that into the core numbers and what happens on the ground that's why every central bank now is talking about core inflation rather than headline inflation because they know that's the sticky one that's the one we could see headline inflation posted negative numbers but that core may still stay up and that's the one they've got to fight because that's the one that really entrenches into their economies yeah absolutely and i think your point on activity data was interesting obviously we get the latest pmi numbers towards the back end of this week but it is a bit of a strange one how the market is trading activity data at the moment sometimes you've seen uh, data come in softer than expected and the market sells the hell out of the dollar because it points to a soft landing what we saw on friday was a little bit different it was almost the market saying this resale sales number is recessionary so we want to buy the dollar and i think that just shows how quickly sentiment can change at the moment it's really a market where investors and traders are just latching on to whatever narrative they want to and, and really reading into the data whatever fits their priors almost well it's, it's the old saying it takes two to make a market uh, and there's two sides and you know we, we always talk about, you know, the, the, the boat running phenomena where the market always runs to one side of the boat, it tips and then, you know, they can't go any further and then we go the other way. And I think we're going to see this a lot over the months ahead with each piece of data, good data, you see dollar rally, you see yield rally, bad data, you see the opposite happening. And it's going to be a battle until we get to the Fed and find out exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the other thing is a lot of this data is, you know, what you call second tier data. It's not the top tier jobs, inflation, GDP prints that we would usually trade off the back of, which uh, makes things a little bit spicier as well. Um, what about your first topic? What's going on over in Japan? I know this is one you've been watching closely lately. Yeah, we've been watching it for a while on the show, as you know, and uh, we've got a we've got a big piece of data coming up on Friday, uh, early in the morning in Asia, and that's that's the Japanese CPI, the main numbers, and CPI is expected at three point two percent versus three point three percent prior, so dropping just a pip. Um, one of their core measures is the ex fresh food number, and that's expected to come in unchanged at three point one percent. Um, the core core, if you like, the ex food and energy number, that's expected to rise to three point seven percent from three point five percent. Now, what we heard from the old guy Kuroda all through his tenure is that they expect CPI to come down, even though it's been rising. Um, they still expect this to be temporary. It's going to go to their target or perhaps even below over the months ahead. So these numbers are going to be really important for the next Bank of Japan meeting, which is obviously where the new guy, Ueda, makes his first appearance. Um, we've heard from him recently in Parliament, various appearances, G20s, G7s, and his message has pretty much been along the lines of Kuroda, that easing policy is the way forward. We're going to continue with that, see no reason to change that. But this data is going to get the market guessing as to whether his actual first monetary policy appearance, he's going to put something in there that's going to open the door to ending this, this massive easing cycle they've been on. And you've got to remember with, with Japan and the Bank of Japan is that even the smallest comment, even the smallest language change can cause a big reaction uh, in the market. Now, I'm not expecting him to come in and say, right, we're hiking rates uh, from <laughs> May onwards, but any subtle language changes and the market's going to move. Now, if he comes in and, and really acts like Kuroda and says, nope, we don't care about where inflation is now, we're still expecting it to fall, the job's not done, we're going to continue easing, then, you know, you're going to see implications for, for the yen there um, and you're going to see it weaken quite a lot. If he does put something in there, then we're going to see some decent strength uh, in the yen and uh, who knows where we may end up. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really, really interesting one to watch. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to Japan as a whole and, and the Bank of Japan more specifically. I mean, the, the other thing, and Bloomberg had a good piece on this over the weekend, saying that there's a lot of speculation in Japan at the moment, and some of this has been uh, quelled by the, the events over the weekend with the, the Prime Minister, that they may actually end up having an early election. And if you end up with elections towards the, the autumn of, of this year, then that really leads you to question, well, actually, are the Bank of Japan really going to tighten policy when you've got an election going on? You argue probably not. Um, so that's another piece to, to put in into the puzzle, as you, you say at the bottom of the screen there. Um, I do think it's notable, though, how 
we were expecting, or, or at least I was expecting, when Ueda took over, not necessarily a, a huge hawkish shift immediately, but not exactly a carbon copy of, of what Corona has been saying for the last decade or so. And that's what we've got so far. And I do just wonder whether we should be reading a little bit more into that and saying, actually, we are going to see policy normalize, but it is going to be a Q4-23, Q1-24 story. And if so, what does that mean for the yen? You would argue it probably means downside. But you're absolutely right. If we do see, it, it really is a, a game of sort of subtlety when it comes to the Bank of Japan and their statements and, and what they put out. Any subtle changes in language, the addition of a word, the, the removal of a word, that is really what the yen is going to trade off. And I think if you are trading the yen, if you are trading around those Bank of Japan decisions, of all the central banks, I mean, this is important no matter who you're dealing with, but of all the central banks, this is probably the one where you really need to be at top of what exactly did the previous statement say? What's the language that recent speeches from the governor, from the deputy governors have been using? And how does what they're saying now differ from that? Because it is those very, very slight changes that will cause very, very big market moves. Not only because that's how they operate, but also because we've had decades of pretty much nothing in terms of changes of policy or if there have been changes, it's been easing. And as a result of that, the market any uh, hawkish rhetoric is is going to be seized on, I think. Yeah, and you've also got to remember that, you know, e even if you don't trade the yen, what happens in, in yen, yen crosses, yen pairs, can drive the majors as well. So, you know, if you're in a euro dollar position and something big happens in this CPI number and, and euro yen moves, you're going to see euro dollar move as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's move it over to here in the UK. It's a huge week coming up for economic data here in the UK, joy, which means we're all going to be pouring over the ONS website at pretty much seven o'clock every morning this week, working out what's going on. Well, I will be, maybe Ryan will still be yeah. in bed. Um, it, we've got a lot of data coming out. We've got, uh, well, we've already had the jobs numbers. They came out uh, this morning on, on Tuesday. We've then got inflation on uh, Wednesday, tomorrow morning. And then Friday, we've got the latest retail sales and PMI figures. So all of this is probably, it is probably the most important week in terms of economic data and in terms of policy expectations and framing for the next BOE decision on the 11th of May. Now, the BOE expectations are pretty much 50-50, let's be honest. They're 50-50 on this show, and they're 50-50 on uh, economist surveys as well as to whether they give us another hike at the May meeting or not. And I think everyone knows which camp Ryan and I are in at the moment. Um, I think that the data this week is likely to reinforce the case for rate hikes being done. 4.25% terminal rate for bank rate, and May will probably be the time when the BOE say, we're done. We're on hold. If we need to do more, we might. A conditional pause, as we saw from the BOC and the RBA. But I would argue that that leaves the bar very, very high to actually resume rate hikes. Um, if you dig into what the data is saying so far, the jobs numbers were quite messy, to be honest with you. And I haven't had a chance to fully go through it yet because it only came out about an hour ago. But unemployment rising to 3.8% in the three months to February. That's a negative. But on the other side of that, earnings growth heating up again. Uh, earnings growing by just north of 6% on, on an annualized basis compared to the three months prior. That is a bit of a worrying sign for the BOE. I think the really important one to watch is the inflation number that we get tomorrow morning. We're expecting headline CPI to drop below 10% on a yearly basis for the first time since August of 2022. Now, I appreciate how idiotic it sounds, me her heralding that as a positive, but we're moving in the right direction. We've had six, seven months now north of that 10% number. So it is a good sign that we're seeing that come lower. And of course, when you move into April, the, the base effects and the energy price guarantee should see that come uh, lower still. And then of course, as we move into the back end of the week, we've got those activity numbers, retail sales set to fall by about half of 1% on a monthly basis. And the PMI should print to um, I should point, sorry, to a, a slowing of momentum in the services sector and continued contraction in the manufacturing sector as well. So I think given how the BOE have been acting lately, given how there's a lot of doves on the MPC, they will probably latch on to any positive signs when it comes to inflation and any signs of risks in terms of growth and use that as a reason to bring rate hikes to an end. But the last point I want to make on this before throwing it over to you, Ryan, is markets still price another 50 basis points worth of hikes from the BOE between now and 
September. So if we do see some of this data come in and surprise to the downside, if we do see the BOE increasingly indicate that they're going to be hitting that pause button at the May meeting, then there is some significant room for that to be priced out. And I would argue as well, some room for sterling to correct lower. What are your thoughts on all of that, Nick? Yeah, well, we're going to have the same old discussion, I'm afraid. I mean, I agree with you entirely. Yet yeah, the BOE are, are looking to, to head towards a pause or, or take rates as, as far as they think they need to go. Um, we could see inflation coming down. I don't think it's going to come down as fast as we've seen elsewhere. I think it's going to remain sticky for much longer. I mm. wouldn't be surprised if it if it holds the same or even rises at, at the next report, but we shall see. There's a long way to go before we see some of these energy prices coming out. Uh, at the moment, they've just been held. Um but prices are still going up. Even we've got these guarantees and everything in play, prices have still gone up. Um, so I, I'm not expecting inflation to come down as fast as elsewhere. The Bank of England probably will go to a pause uh, or indicate that, you know, maybe they've got one or two more hikes in them and they're done. Um, I think they'll be incorrect with that. I think they may be forced into a, an RBNZ situation where they were heading to a pause and then they surprised with a 50 pip hike the other week. So, Different circumstances, they had uh, the weather problems over there, but I think it's going to be similar for the Bank of England. Um, they're going to be forced to, to hike longer than, than they think they're going to need to, or higher than they think they're going to need to, and they're going to have to hold it up there higher than they think they need to as well. So that's going to give us an opportunity. If it goes the way you say it goes, um, then that means if they do have to turn hawkish again, it's going to be a surprise in the market. So if you're trading a pound, you need to be careful of that. And as we have the other central bank, it's all about watching the data. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other complicating factor with the BOE is I don't think they've got a clue what they're going to do. So <laughs> let alone us trying to second guess it. Um, it is going to lead to volatility, though, hopefully, fingers crossed, because things have got rather too quiet, haven't they? Yeah, volatility is, is something I keep an eye on. Um, and that's one of the first things I noticed when I when I got back from holiday and I, I switched back on my screens. I have a look around and, and see what's going on trying to step back in and get into the flow of things and volatility is very important and it's very important for our trading um now when i watch volatility i watch something called the uh, one month at the money option folds and this is it's just basically a good wide gauge of how volatile markets are at the moment um so since december you know you look at something like dollar yen it's been running at, at 12 to 14 percent vols now we're down to 10 percent Euro dollars been running at nine to ten percent in in the vols. Now we're down around about seven and eight percent. Cable as well, ten to twelve percent since December. Now we're down at eight percent. And what I look at is is the rule of thumb. The baseline is really about six seven percent. Okay, if we're on that, markets are generally calm, um, and that gives us a, 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 a say a baseline for how markets and prices react day to day uh, in between important data points and headlines. And so if we're above 6 7%, we're getting into higher volatility territory. That's where a headline or a piece of data may move the market 30, 40, 50 pips, whereas below 6 7%, it may only move it 10, 15, 20 pips. And why that's important is because if you're trading markets and if you're trading high volatile markets, you're going to get big swings um, and you factor that into your trading. And when Vol moves lower. I mean, you know, we've seen it uh, before the pandemic. Vols uh, in something like euro dollar were, were trading around about four percent. We were yeah. sitting here watching watching euro dollar moving twenty pips a day, and it's important that because if you're trading, you need to know what your what your daily ranges are. You know, is dot euro dollar going to move a hundred pips uh, during a day? Was it going to move fifty pips during a day? And that you need to factor in. So if you're trading, you can't expect in a low vol environment to get in a short-term trade and think you're going to make uh, 200 pips in, in 20 minutes. Not going to happen, but you'll get that in a high vol environment, perhaps on a piece of data or headline, as we've seen. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't going to see volatile moves. We're going to see volatile moves around the data, but it's the periods in between. When if fall is coming down, that's when you get prices not moving. Um, and that's what you've got to watch for. So make your money, make your pips over the data, be careful if the volatility is low that you may be then sitting in a trade and uh, picking your nose from it, <laughs> as we say. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I'm going to make a few points on vol in a minute. I want to ask you a question first, and I haven't prepped you for this, and I don't actually know the answer to it. Um, obviously, implied vols, I can just pull them up on Bloomberg, Reuters, whatever. How can a retail trader get access to that information? 
Um, there is a uh, an, an options uh, broker that have a handy widget. I, I don't know if I want to mention it uh, <laughs> on your show, um, but uh, if you want to know where it is, you can get in contact with me uh, at Forex Analytics on Twitter or at ForexFlow.live, and uh, we can let you know where that is. But there's a, there's a handy widget uh, that you can look at for that. We we went very BBC there, didn't we? You know, can't <laughs> yeah. promote anything. You know, other brokers are available. All of that nonsense. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I, I think the the fall that we've seen involve really since probably two or three weeks ago, it's been a case of the market initially breathing a big sigh of relief over the the banking issues. Obviously, that all kind of coming to an end. The Fed stepping in in size to provide liquidity to those institutions that were in trouble. And of course, we then had uh, market pricing for Fed funds has, has stabilized a little bit in, in the mix as well. And then, of course, you've got this situation where it ends up becoming a little bit self-fulfilling because you haven't just seen volatility fall off in the FX market. If you look at uh, Bank of America's Move Index, which tracks um, vol in, in the Treasury space, that's at its lowest in uh, a couple of months. The VIX is at its lowest level in about a year since April of, of 2022. And it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, particularly in the equity market, where volatility comes lower. That spurs a round of institutional buying, which brings vol lower still, which brings more buyers into the market and, and, and up to the table. And as a result of that, it, it kind of sparks this, this virtuous cycle, if you like. But it does mean, at least in my mind, if you look at the FX market, one week and one month vols are pretty much at the bottom of their 12-month range. The same in equities, the same in treasuries, and the same in commodities as well, if you broaden it out even more. And it does just leave me pondering a little bit where the markets have started to get a bit too complacent, because there are still plenty of risks out there banking breakdown is it over is it not to what level do, do rates rise and how long do we stay there i think markets are probably underpricing that still and of course you've got this myriad of geopolitical risks out there as well taiwan ukraine middle east um all the rest of it going on so i do just wonder whether markets have perhaps got a little bit uh, you know got a little bit too relaxed too soon when some of these issues are, are still unresolved and i think that could be something worth watching um over the weeks and months ahead yeah, definitely. And, you know, there might be a bit of exhaustion creeping in as well. You know, we obviously saw vol spike over the, the banking issues. We've come out of that pretty much OK. And sometimes the market just, you know, takes a, a moment to, to gather its thoughts and have a pause for breath. And, and we see vols coming down. But you're right, there's, there's enough still going on in the world um, that we could see vols moving back up again. Yes, absolutely. Well, with that said and done, let's get into some charts. So the first thing I want to look at this week is crude WTI to be specific, although you could pretty much draw the same thing on, on a chart of Brent. Uh, I've just chosen WTI because it was the first thing I had saved uh, on my terminal. The thing that I think is really interesting uh, about oil at the moment, again, both blends of, of crude that, that we trade, is the fact that the market had this big gap higher when OPEC announced their supply cuts, their output cuts uh, a couple of weeks ago, obviously one and a half million barrels per day. But what's really interesting is that the market's actually managed to hold on to those gains. Because when it happened, we're all kind of thinking this is great for a short term move. But if we're going to see demand soften in the months ahead as activity slows, are we likely to see this really um, as a kind of short term rally? Then that gap is going to be filled and we'll be back in the range relatively quickly. That hasn't happened. We've held nicely above $80 a barrel. And more importantly, we've held above the 82 handle quite considerably. And if, if you look at the intraday price action, buyers are, are stepping in around that mark in, in size every time we, we get close to it. Um, I think to the upside, you've really got to look at the 200-day moving average now. That's a level that WTI hasn't traded above and certainly hasn't closed above since last August. And I think if we do get a closing break above that level, then we really could start to motor higher. Um, it, it's not Crude is not something I would trade solely on technicals, of course, but you've got to look at the case at the moment where the data that we had overnight out of China, yes, usual caveat supply, we can't exactly trust what they're saying, but it was all very, very strong. Industrial production, retail sales, GDP, 
all coming in better than expected. The market is holding above that $80 a barrel mark. And it does look like we could be in for a sustained rally, particularly if we can take out that 200 day, which of course has growth and inflation implications for the broader macro economy. Um, you can play it in the FX space. You can play it through something like dollar CAD. You can play it through uh, the NOC even, although I would probably prefer to play it via the CAD if you were going to do it in the FX space, because the correlation between the NOC and crude just seems to have completely broken down of late, which is why my Euro knock trade a few weeks ago got stopped out. But there we are. Ryan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this is one I, I looked at uh, also uh, in the last uh, couple of shows. And the, the 8250 was was my line. And I was thinking that perhaps we got a similar sort of move to how we got down at that 72, 73 level that you can see there it was a solid bottom. We got a break below, it held below. We got a move down of eight bucks. Um, I think, you know, I was looking at shorts into this one. I did short this one into the 82.50, but I kept it very tight. Um, we haven't seen the, the level of break on the top side like we saw on the downside. And as you say, that 200-day moving average is keeping things in check. And we're sort of waffling around the 82.50 mark as well. But I think you're spot on. If if we keep above 82, that keeps the upside and that keeps the, the, the move from the lows in play. But it can, it's going to need to break that upside level. And, uh, you know, yeah, oil is a very fundamental market, but at moments it can be very technical as well. And uh, the techs are clear to see it, uh, as you can see there. Absolutely. What about the euro? The euro, good old euro, um, always a seller. Anyone you ask, they always want to sell this one, but uh, you've always got to look both ways at the euro. Um, and this one, it's doing what a lot of dollar pairs are doing. Um, we obviously saw dollar weakness. It's been trending higher. It's moved up. It broke above. Uh, you can see that uh, that pre previous top that we saw um, around about the, you know the one that ten thirty area looked like it was going to be off to a flyer. But then we got that change around on Friday, and we're right back below that level now. So that's concerning that, it, that it's a fake break. It's dropped back down to the, to the low 109s. It's holding 109 uh, at the moment. So that keeps the momentum in play. Um, if it's going to crack this rally, it's really got to get below, firstly, that 38.2 fib of, of the rally there, uh, which comes right in the middle of a, a zone, uh, a traffic zone, as I call it, 108.30, 08.70. Uh, this is one of these areas where the price always does something in between. You can see the, the price action in, in that blue zone. So I think if, if we're going to break this trend, then it needs to get below that 108.30 level. You can see that that prior low, that will change things around. If it doesn't, if we hold around the 109s, maybe down to 108.70, that's the place you, you can perhaps look for a long to continue this rally. We have another crack at 110. Um, but I expect that 110.30 to be uh, resistance again. This is pretty simple one, just play the technical ranges. But if they start breaking, you either go with them or you know your trade's wrong if you're going against them. I'm going to do something very rare here for uh -oh. people who know me and say I'm not going to say anything because, <laughs> spoiler alert, my play of the day involves euro dollar and uh, we'll get on to that in a while. So I'm not going to talk about this now. We'll talk about it in about 10 minutes' time. My lips are sealed uh, and stay tuned for which way I want to play things. Um, what about the S&P 500? I think that's the first time we've ever finished a segment early. There's the trick. One of us <laughs> can't speak. Uh, <laughs> uh, the S&P, everything is going quite nicely if you're an equity bull at the moment. The path of least resistance leading us nicely higher. It's not a case where every day is a gain, but actually that's quite healthy. You don't want to see this relentless daily grind higher of a percent every day because that implies a market that's moving too far too quickly. I think what's important for me is that I, I saw this stat on the trade in this morning. I think it's now been 17, maybe 18 days that the S&P has gone without a daily decline of over 1%, which is the longest run that we've had since the bear market began in, well, I guess you could say January of last year. And that just implies that we are starting to see buying, not necessarily speculative buying, but a more sustainable and constructive rally starting to come through in the equity space. And of course, this is also being seen in wh whether you look at the, the NASDAQ, whether you look at the Russell, or if you're you know, slightly warped mind and you want to trade the Dow, you can also look at that and see the same thing there. 
everything's going quite well. Treasury yields are relatively stable. The two-year is just north of 4%, but it doesn't really want to move too far north of that 4% handle, it would seem. Earnings so far have come in okay. I think the, the bank earnings that we've seen uh, on Friday and, and yesterday have come in above expectations and started to soothe a few nerves about the sector more broadly. Obviously, we have Goldman, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley still to report, and then you get into the real meat of earnings season with some of the big tech firms in the, the following fortnight. So that's a risk worth having on the horizon. If, if we see those tech earnings come in soft, then that is likely to be a fairly stiff headwind for equities. But then you look at a few other factors. And, and as I said earlier in the show, the data that we're getting coming in, yes, activity softening, but is pointing to a soft landing, not an outright catastrophe for the United States. And of course, the dollar is continuing to roll over as well. So a lot to like. The path of least resistance leading us higher for now. I guess the, the big question is, what is the market going to do at 4,200? We haven't traded above 4,200 in the S&P since early February. And when we got there, we couldn't exactly break it. And we came back lower very, very quickly towards the bottom of that range at 3,800. So we haven't really been above 4,200 since last summer, really, August, September last year. If we can get above it, if we can get a closing break above it, then I think the bulls really are in control of things. Things, and we may get a bit of a run higher. But if we do stall here, if again 4,200 proves to be stiff resistance, then I think we're going to take a trip down back to the bottom of that near-term range around 4,050. But personally, um, I favour playing this from the long side. I think with volatility coming lower and with all of those other factors in play, um, I think shorting equities is, uh, is a little bit of a tough one for me at the moment. Yeah, well, I absolutely love the fact that you're using this chart, uh, the S&P, because one thing I like is is tech perfection. And this chart tells us uh, a lot of different things. Firstly, it tells me from the beginning of the year up to now, it's been a period of consolidation. You know, we've had a look at the downside. We've had a look at the upside, but we're not really trending anywhere. Um, so we're just going a bit sideways within decent ranges. And the reason I like this chart as well is because the world and his mate are looking at this 4200 area. Um, so that gives us two ways to, to trade it. It's a solid level. If it shows up to be a solid level as it is now, then you can trade it on the short side, maybe get a move down to your 40, 50, maybe if it breaks that, even down to the lower end at 3,800. But you're going to know that as so many people are looking at this, if they're trading short off of this, the stops are going to be building above 42. So if you do get a break, it's likely to be volatile. We'll probably see 4,300 in, in a flash not long after. So if you're trading it, want to short it, fine but be careful and wary if it breaks maybe flip that into a long try and ride the the breakthrough and uh make your money on that side instead but uh it's not often you get technical perfection in charts and and this one's a great one at the moment oh technical perfection is mr morrow listening can we frame that i, I think that's the the biggest compliment that, that ryan's ever paid me he's, um, he's gonna give you a badge you can wear a yeah. badge <laughs> he's gonna steal the chart as well now um, knowing him uh, <laughs> The, the one last point I would just make on this before we move on, and, and this is something that applies across all markets, as you rightly said, every man and his dog or every person and their dog, I guess we have to say in this day and age, is watching this 4200 level. Um, as with every market, don't put your stops on a round number, depending on what side you're on, put them slightly above, put them slightly below, because it is that round number bias that everyone has, and you want to try and avoid that if you can. Dollar CAD. Yeah, well, this this plays in a, a bit with your your oil that you were talking about earlier, um, but this was one we we spoke about at the beginning of of April, and you know it was coming down to one thirty five, and one thirty five was a pretty strong area. I was looking at this one for longs, um, uh, longs off of that area would have got you about thirty forty pips uh, if you called it quickly. Then we had a break under, it held under, and then it had a little bit moved down. Then it broke back up again. So it's been a little bit wishy washy, but. The main thing from, from that two weeks ago is if we did get a, a, a substantial break of 135, we're potentially heading all the way down to, to 133. And again, this is another chart where it's almost technical perfection as well because we're in this sort of, you can call it a long-term wedge or whatever. We've had two touches on the upside. We've now had four touches on the downside and it's held on that bottom trend line. It has moved up again now. Um, so if you did manage to catch those shorts from the break of 135, you had a perfect place to get out, uh, maybe even turn long. And um, what I'm expecting now is maybe a bit of a range of event between that 135 and that 133 that we've already seen. The fib of this move down from the top of that uh, 
channel or wedge or whatever you want to call it, um, comes in around about 135.15. So I'm expecting that 135 to solidify as a bit of a resistance area. So move up to there. Maybe you can look at that for short, but above 135.15.20, you're probably wrong and maybe we get a move to, to 135. But simple charts, simple levels. I don't need too much on this one. Um, another one for tech perfection. Do I get bad? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, can we have two badges sent over from Arizona, please? Um, no, I think it's a really interesting one. And, and as you say, it does seem like we've reached a little bit of a bottom here at this kind of 133 region. And the, and the, and the price is starting to try uh, and claw its way back. Um, personally, as, as I think most people will know at this point, I'm quite bearish on the dollar. So I will be looking uh, for this to come lower and, and, and perhaps even break that 133 handle. And of course, if we do get a break of that 133, then we could really start to see things motor lower back down towards uh, 130. But dollar cad's an interesting one. There's there's a lot of moving parts. I think the Canadian economy, of course, doesn't have especially much going for it at the moment. There's a big, big, big problem in Canada with um, household debt burdens and, and housing prices and bubbles. Of course, it's not something you can trade spot FX off, but it's certainly worth having on the radar because if things do start to go south, there is an argument to be made that the BOC are going to be looking to ease and loosen policy perhaps quicker and to a greater degree than their uh, their G10 peers. So uh, a risk worth having on the horizon. But I think at the moment, my theory is bearish dollar, bullish crude, you're going to be looking for, for dollar CAD to uh, to come lower and test the bottom of that range if, if you're holding those two views. Um, let's get on to uh, play of the day. It's a good sign that I've momentarily forgotten the name of a segment on my own show. Can you tell we're recording this quite early in the morning? Um, anyway, Euro dollar, as I said earlier, I didn't want to mention it because it is my play of the day and it pains me to say it. I feel like I need to go and get some soap and wash my mouth out having delivered this segment. But there's a lot to like about the euro at the moment. And I don't like wanting to be long euro. But if we get a decent break of 110 and a closing break of that figure, um, then I think that is the way to be playing things. There's a lot going for the common currency. The ECB are very, very hawkish indeed. I think some of the ECB speakers are as hawkish as we've heard in, in a very, very long time, even some of the dovish members on the, the governing council are saying that there's going to be at least two more rate hikes, if you listen to what uh, people like Philip Lane are saying. Um, and of course, that's if their baseline holds, which it does seem to be doing so at the moment. The dollar is continuing to, to take a battering pretty much across the board, although we have seen uh, some of that selling pressure abate a little over the last couple of trading sessions. But I think one point that really interests me, and I'm not sure this has got as, as much attention as it deserves, is actually, if you look at equity performance, Europe is really starting to outperform compared to what we're seeing in the United States. The CAC 40 over in France, that's a, an all-time high. The DAX is trading at, at decent levels as well, and the Stocks 50 closed at its highest level since uh, December of 2007 yesterday. Year-to-date, up around about 13 14%, most European equity indices. The S&P 500 is up somewhere between 6 and 7%. So, if we see that outperformance continue, that is likely to start peaking the interest of institutional and international investors. If we do see inflows into European equities, that is another bullish catalyst to add to the list when it comes to the euro. So I think from a fundamental level, the euro has got a lot going for it. On a technical level, I'm not looking to get in now, but if we get a closing break north of 110, um, then I will be looking for those two initial targets around 111.30 and then 111.85 if we can go further. Um, a break below that uh, rather a horrible coloured brown trend line at around 109.20. If we break below that, then I would look to reassess things just a little bit. Um, Ryan, what about the two-year treasury? Yeah, two-year treasuries, keeping an eye on these, and, and again, this is one we've, we've watched previously, because it's given an indication of where the market is looking at, at Fed rates. Um, you can see on that chart there, we've got the, the Fed funds rate midpoint, so in between the middle of where Fed rates are at the moment. And the two years well below. So that's the market telling us that they're not expecting rates to get up um, or they can't even get up to where Fed's funds rate are at the moment. Um, so that's that's the dovish side of the market coming in there. Um, we've got a big technical level coming up at 4.26. Um, it's been the bottom of a band that we've seen previously. And we're heading up that way now. I think on the first test, it's been a good uh, zone uh, where it's held. So if you get up there, then obviously in the price you want to be buying, uh, or I'll be looking to buy at that level there. 
looking for a move maybe that back down to four percent in yields if we get down there again take some profit off the table bring the stops in and just see if, sit on the trade and see if you can push it uh, as far as it will go um I'm, I'm never one to to give up a winning trade early i'd rather take some money off the table sit in the rest of the trade lock my stops in behind and see where we want to go so pure technical trader of the level here Good stuff. Well, that brings us to the end of another another show. Thank you very much, as always, for joining me, Ryan, from Forex Flow Live and Forex Analytics. And also, thank you for not mentioning the football too much. That really is very much appreciated. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was half expecting you in a West Ham jersey or something this morning. I thought about it. I really thought about it. At least I have my scarf in, in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have my Arsenal scarf if we win the league at the end of the year. Um, thank you also to uh, Kyriakos, our producer, for stringing this together so brilliantly, as always. Um, all three of us will be back again this time next week. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave a like on the video, leave a comment as well. Let us know how you're trading the markets. And uh, thank you, as always, for watching. Goodbye for now.